Okay, so then, um, my talk is going to be about advanced functionality for power electric systems. And just like Lucas before, I will also talk a little bit about domain wars. Um, the research um, we are working on is funded by the Norwegian Research Council and through an ERC grant. And um, in general, in my team, what we're interested in are functional topological systems, magnetic and electric objects with emergent functionality at the nanoscale. And like all of us here, we, are, uh, we like to use scanning probe microscopy. But in addition to that, we are also using microprobes, um, FIP-SEM, TEM, 3D atom probe, uh, and PM-LEAM to really cover all relevant length scales um, to look at the problem on all sides. So these are the techniques we are specialized in, and um, that is the team of PhD students and postdocs um, working together with me on that. Uh, the data I'm going to show to you today was mainly taken by Jakob and Peggy, who already finished their PhD, uh, as well as Donald and Theo, um, showing some recent publications also, we just published two or three weeks ago. So I'm hope, uh, hopefully there will be some exciting results for all of you. In addition to the team, uh, we also have a lot of um, invaluable collaborations in-house here at NTNU, for example, with um, Sleva Selba, very important for us doing DFT calculations, so that we do not just have some microscopy data, but also can develop uh, a microscopic understanding of what's really going on in the materials. So, but let me start now. Oh, sorry, now I almost jumped. <laughs> um, here you see our external collaborators, also very important. Uh, what I would like to highlight here is especially collaborations with Julia Mundi, who did um, a lot of TM and yields measurements together with us at the, um, at the domain wars, and uh, especially Zhe Yan, who grew a lot of the samples we are working with. So very important collaboration for us over the last years. So now, as I already said, it is about domain wars. Um, these are for us important um, ingredients to mimic electronic components at the nanoscale. And whenever we are talking about classical uh, ferroelectric, the system will split up into domains, region with a homogeneous orientation of the order parameter, in our case, electric dipoles. Um, and in the simplest case, they can point one way in one domain and in the other way, 180 degrees um, changed in the other domain. And in between, we have our domain wall. We already heard that these domain walls can develop very special properties, completely different from the surrounding bulb. They can be insulating, even though the bulb is um, conducting. But we also have lower symmetry that can allow other emerging phenomena. It becomes now extremely interesting, we've seen that already before, uh, that when we have charged domain walls like this, so when the, there's a polarization component um, perpendicular to the wall that changes. In this case, we end up with bound charges. In this case, for such a tail-to-tail -tail domain wall, negative bound charges. So we have divergent electrostatic potential. That is, of course, energetically very unfavorable, so the material need to do something about it. And when the system is, for example, a p-type semiconductor, what it will do is it will bring all its mobile holes to this domain wall so that um, the charges are screened. As a consequence, the material will have enhanced conductivity at these domain walls because you have more hole carriers available here compared to there. This was already recognized early on. Um, first device applications were proposed by Wool et al. in 1973, where they thought, okay, if we have these highly conducting domain walls, we could control conductivity by writing and erasing the domain walls in between two electrodes. So um, this was an interesting idea, but at that time, not really accessible. Much later, it then became possible to also visualize these electronic properties at the domain walls. We've heard about this in Bay already, and here's an early example from 84, where people recognized in SEM that the electronic composition or um, performance of these domain walls, had to have walls in this case, is different compared to the uh, domains on the left and on the right. At that time, we did not really know what's going on there. There were some ideas, but we just learned from Lucas um, what is really happening here. Uh, so it is not just an idea. People uh, are nowadays able to measure that. And it's not just a listening eye, but actually there are so many materials around, and this, this is almost growing by the day, which show ex, um, conducting domain walls if you play it right. It can be related to the defect chemistry or domain wall inclination angles, but we now know that bismuth ferrite, PZT, barium titan, and other materials all show uh, conducting domain walls. Here are some review articles you can refer to. And um, what all these ideas have in common now 
is that you write and erase domain walls to control connectivity. This is an example from Jan uh, Seidel in 2009 showed that when you change the number of domain walls going from zero, two, four, six, uh, between two electrodes, you can play with the connectivity. So you have a multi-state um, resistance device where you can change it with the number of domain walls. Other ideas are these three terminal devices uh, by Thomas Luca and uh, Sasha Vagansev, where connectivity is controlled between um, these electrodes also by erasing and writing domain walls. So what all these approaches have in common is that they make use of the fact that we inject, move, and domain, uh, erase conducting domain walls. Um, what I now would like to bring forward is a different idea, because when we do it like this, we are still having uh, classical device geometries. That's why I call it classical domain wall electronics. The idea usually is we have two electrodes and we write and erase domain walls. So we are not really benefiting from the atomic scale width of the walls and their um, ultra small feature size. So the idea we are having, or we are working is, is to go beyond just conductivity and use the intrinsic electronic properties of the domain walls to mimic the behavior of electronic components. So we don't move them anymore. We keep them where they are and want to use their special physics to do something with it. So you see here in a, uh, a larger image, which is colored. And the idea is that when we have a domain wall, this one, for example, that's domain wall one, one functionality. Another domain wall has a different functionality. So it's sketched here. Uh, wall one could be an OR gate, wall two, a logical gate, another wall, a diet. So they all take different roles. And then, so this is now me dreaming. In the best case scenario, we are able to wire them up, make circuitry at the, at the, at the local scale, and really push the limits what can be done with domain walls. But as I said, this is me dreaming. So what I would now like to discuss in the rest of my time is how close are we to this? What is really science? What is still fiction? And what possibilities do we have going in this direction? Um, I will first talk a little bit about emulating electronic components at the nanoscale, what is possible right now. And in the second part, I will propose an idea that we could use to then wire up these domain walls, which are sitting in different positions, and we don't want to move them anymore. So our model system is the so-called improper ferroelectric urban manganite, or the hexagonal manganite in general. What you see on the left-hand side is a Peter response force microscopy image, where dark means polarization pointing upwards, Bright means polarization pointing downwards. And what you can see right away is that the material does not really care about the polarization direction. The domain walls are meandering around as if there would be not a uniaxial ferroelectric. And this is the interesting thing. It happens because it is an improper ferroelectric. So that this improper ferroelectricity comes into play. What's happening at the ferroelectric phase transition or at the high temperature phase transition? We first have a symmetry breaking uh, transition uh, with respect to the structure. This manganese oxygen octahedra or uh, bipyramids can tilt either inwards or outwards. They push the intermediate rare earth ion up or down. And that's then as a secondary effect, as a byproduct, gives me the polarization. So the structural order parameter is the driving force and the strong one, and the um, polarization is just a secondary effect. And this is why these walls can be under around, and then they're also stuck at these meeting points here. So we really get, when we look at that at the nanoscale, all types of charged domain walls naturally in the s ground state. That was just a question before, can we have that? In this material, you get it for free due to the improper paralytic nature. These are now TEM images, and you see here the sequence of rare earth ions change from up, up, down, up, up, down, to down, down, up, down, down, up. That allows us to read the polarization direction. Because of the mandarin, we have tail-to-tail -tail domain walls. We have head-to-head -head domain walls, and we can also find walls in neutral charge state. So that's really a very nice test material because we get it all for free. And what's already established at the electronic transport behavior is determined by the polarization state. We heard about that before. We can have accumulation or depletion of whole carriers enhanced and reduced conductivity. And because of this, we can consider these interfaces really as robust quasi-2D semiconductors. What we already showed in 2012 then is the um, conduction properties of these domain walls. You see here the conductive atomic force microscopy map, head to head domain walls. That's where we have the positive charges. Our um, holes in this P type system move away. We have reduced conductivity, it's dark. At the tail to tail domain walls, holes accumulate to screen the negative bound charges, giving us enhanced conductivity. And when we walk along such a domain wall, you see that it gradually decreases in conductance until we hit these neutral points, like here, where we have byproduct behavior. 
Um, since it's a semiconductor, it's not a big surprise that when you cool the system down, you see semiconducting behavior, our conductivity goes down in the domain walls as well as in the bulk. But something really nice is happening here because we are cooling the system down. It's ferroelectric, polarization gets larger. So we get an extra pyroelectric charge of about 1.5 nanocoulomb per centimeter squared as we cool down. At the same time, we have an exponentially, exponentially decreasing carrier mobility. So the relaxation time is going up. So even though our, our walls get even more charged, now we cannot bring the carriers to, there to screen them. So there's a characteristic temp, um, temperature below which walls remain partially unscreened. Can that happen? Yes. You see that even in low temperature EFM measurements, as you cool down and the walls are no longer screened, we see the extra per, um, charge and the walls produce a huge electrostatic heat. It's not even uh, just visible in EFM. You can also use PEAM, for example. It's very same effect. If you go to low temperatures, the secondary electron sees a strong field from these uncharged walls. So we really have a rare example of an oxide interface that is stable, even though we're not screened. That's quite exciting. And on top of that, we still don't lose the um, possibility to move the walls around if we really want to. Then we have to apply much higher fields than those we are usually working at in uh, CFM, but it's possible. We can pole it and move the walls around. So in um, summary, what we can say now about the model system is we really have diverse electronic transport properties at the walls. That's what we really want when we want to mimic different behavior. We have the, still the spatial mobility if needed. For instance, when we uh, in the beginning want to design where the walls are sitting at high temperature and high voltage. But at room temperature and where we are working, they're extremely stable and we can then benefit from their really small feature size, hopefully when making these devices. First thing we were showing is um, when we now take these walls, we've seen that before at low voltage, we have conducting tail-to-tail -tail walls on insulating head-to-head -head walls. But if we go higher in voltage, we found that even the head-to-head -head walls become conducting. You can see that in more detail here, the IV curves measured sitting on a wall. Um, you have first insulating head-to-head -head walls, they stay insulating until we get to a certain critical voltage, and then suddenly they also become more conducting than the bulb. So there's a transition from resistive to conductive behavior. We can also understand why. Um, and that's where Julia Mundi then performed some yields measurements. When you sit now at such a head-to-head -head domain wall and do yield spectra, you will figure out that the manganese valence states locally changes from 3 plus to 2.8. So there's effectively an electron charge right at the position of the domain wall. And um, this converts yeah, to 0 0.09 electrons per manganese atom. Why is that? Where do these electrons come from in my p-type semiconductor? Well, if we have very strong band bending, the conduction band minimum dips below the Fermi energy and right at the position of the wall, there will be an inversion layer. So we have depletion and then right at the position of the wall, an inversion layer comes up and this is where our electrons are. And when we have a very nice tip, good surface and everything works well, you can also see that in the CFM state. You see here, we have the insulating outer part of the head-to-head -head wall and the conducting inner part from the inversion layer. So this is nice and we can really work with that. As you see here, we can now take our tip and sit on the domain wall stationary and then go back and forth between the insulating and conducting regime several times and we switch from resistive to conductive behavior reversibly forced and back. So it's like an on-off digital switch based on these, this domain wall and What's also nice is we do not just go between low and high resistive state. Remember what I just said. We switch between two distinct states. We go from hole dominated conductance to electron dominated conductance when we activate this inversion layer at high enough voltages. So that was the first thing. The second device we then try to um, work with or mimic based on the Duane wall is a half wave rectifier. Well, we now have our digital switch. Now let's look at some rectifying diet-like properties. It is well established already that when you have your tip on a surface, we have nothing but a set metal semiconductor. So what you expect when you measure an IV curve is a shot like behavior. When we have a system with two domains up and down, you will also have screening at the surface. So what's well established is that these two domains have different conductivity just because in one case we have more hole carriers which accumulate, in the other case we have less. And you really see that also when you apply an AC voltage, low uh, voltage, and then measure um, the DC output. 
We then get enhanced and reduced productants, this um, the AC response from these two domains. What's really interesting right now is that when we ramp up the conductivity as a frequency, you see at one megahertz, the contrast between the domains is vanishing, but at the domain wars, a contrast now remains or shows up. And if we go even higher, we completely uh, short circuit this contrast in the domain region and end up only with the uh, uh, rectifying behavior AC and DC out at the domain walls. This is because the, the walls here have enhanced conductivity, so they are showing this um, shock like behavior as rectification towards higher frequencies. And because of that, we can then, in a certain frequency regime, only use these domain walls or the um, metal semiconductor interface at the domain wall as a rectifier. So here it's only limited by how small can we make the contact because this, um, the uh, active medium, the domain wall is always five amps very small. That does not change. Yeah? So we really have the chance to shape the waveform, get diet-like behavior um, working with these domain walls. So I think that's already quite nice. Um, at this point, what we have is um, our on digital switch and the diet. All that so far, let me mention that again, was on single crystals. But we are now in the position that we can also work with individual walls. Uh, Eric and Kasper working on that. So we have one publication from last year where we showed that we can take out lamellas and still have the very same behavior as in the bulk crystal. And it's not even possible, as you can see here, to get out an individual domain wall and work with that. So this, I guess, will be quite exciting. Um, that was the first part of my talk where I introduced two components and now in the rest of the time, uh, three minutes, that should do, I will tell you how we could maybe wire them up. So what's already known about the manganites, the system we are working is that interstitials can play an important role for the conductivity and you can create them with nanoscale precision. On the other hand, that's special about the system, vacancies, okay, that's usually the case for oxide, but vacancies also play um, an important role and you can create them with nanoscale precision. So both type of defects play an equally important role for this hexagonal structure. Problem is these defects change the stoichiometry, they are charged, so this most likely also affects the domain wall somehow. So our idea was why not combining them, creating anti-Frankel defects, so interstitial vacancy pairs, uh, which are charge neutral. They don't change the stoichiometry of the material and they are basically invisible, but we should still be able to change the hopping conductivity of the material. Nice idea. How do we do that in reality? Well, let me show you. What we did is we also used the AFM tip, put it on top of our manganite, and we first showed that when we apply negative right voltages above minus five volts, we can change afterwards the readout current, whereas positive voltages don't change. Yeah? And it's independent of the orientation of the crystal, the domains that works everywhere on the system. We then in the next step show that we can increase the uh, conductivity by about four orders of magnitude. And when we do that, uh, pay attention to this, these structures are stable for two years or longer. I could also now go down to the lab and measure it again, and then we can add some months here. Um, so it's different from the other approaches before where people talk about several days of stability. We are now talking about years. So we did different tests. They are thermally stable. The features we can write up to 105 degrees Celsius here. But if we go above the temperature where oxygen becomes mobile, you see, these features then vanish because our oxygen, um, our vacancy at the pairs can recombine. That's our hypothesis. To test that, we also did um, cross-sectional SEM, looked with TEM that we really do not see any defect accumulation in these areas, although there is this big change in conductivity, we performed yields and found really a transition that occurs just because of the anti frankel pair, it cannot be explained by the other types of defects at all, but it's all teeny tiny signatures. And we also confirmed this with DFT and uh, MD simulations. So stability, everything confirmed, uh, but always, how can you be sure about that? Sometimes the simplest experiment is the best. And that's what you see here then at the end. Uh, this really confirmed with the anti frankel defects. Uh, spatial, temporal, spatial temporal map, time versus voltage. And you see when I have my tip stationary and apply voltage, I first have this blob. If I wait a little longer, this blob evolves into two concentric circles. And this you can no longer explain, here we zoom in, by just one type of defect. If it's one type of defect with one charge, it moves either inwards or outwards. You don't get this effect. But when you take into account that we have both vacancies and interstitials, 
you have a clear um, yeah, proof then that we need both type of charges, otherwise this was not workable. So this was our confirmation that we have the anti-Frankel defects along with all the other data. And then when you look at the defect, it's an inter uh, oxygen goes from a lattice side to an interstitial side. You can also calculate the band structure. You get additional levels within the band gap, so it enhances the uh, hopping conductivity. And by that, we have a way to min that is minimally invasive to control the conductivity and write these nanowires, which we then may use to connect our domain wall devices. So that's why I said creating the building blocks for nanotechnology, because I think the data nicely shows that we can use the domain walls to mimic the behavior of electronic components, in our case, digital switches, hardware rectifiers. We have a way of making wires at the required length scale without disturbing the functionality. And so I'm convinced that um, there's a lot of potential here uh, that we still have to explore. Or explore. And if that was too fast now, these were the three papers I was more mainly talking about. And if you have a little more time, uh, there's also now a book where um, a lot of colleagues teamed up to bring up the latest research in the field. And with that, I'm done. And thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>